Now, we have an entire DevSecOps stage at Commit this year, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention security at least once today on the platform stage. I've talked quite a bit about delivering value, but if your software is not secure, it is not valuable. Security is quality, and any DevOps platform worth its salt should be able to automate your security tests into your DevOps lifecycle and do that early and often. For our next talk, I'm happy to invite our sponsor, VMware, to talk about doing exactly that, shifting security left and building it into every aspect of the lifecycle. When you're done today, please check out the rest of our DevSecOps speakers on replay. But for now, let's check in with VMware. Well, hello and welcome to our session, Embracing DevSecOps for Modern Application. My name is Henri Vandenbalk. I'm one of the Executive Technical Advisors in the Tensor Valley Advisory Team. And with me, I have Andreas Vega. Henry, great to be here with you today. I am Andres Vega from VMware. I'm responsible for product security across the TANSA portfolio. Outside of my work, I'm also a technical leader for the CNCF Technical Advisor Group for Security. Love to take the conversation offline. Great place to find us both is on Twitter. You see our Twitter handles on the screen. Uh, feel free to question away any, any thought or feedback at this presentation elicits. Absolutely, we love the, love the engagement and reach out on the social media. So as the goal of DevOps and modern application is really to have rapid release cycles to deliver cap capabilities. Security and compliance can often pose a slowdown or create toll inside an organization to achieving this. In this session, we're both very passionate about secure supply chains and DevSecOps. And what we really want to do today is share with you how you can apply those practices um, with cloud native application development and how you deliver software continuously and maintaining security in your supply chain from start to finish. So thanks for joining us. Why don't we just dive straight, straight in? So according to the 2020 state of software supply chain, we're seeing an incredible increase of the use of open source software. Third party libraries are used more and more. Now this increase um, has been driven by universal desire for faster innovation. More and more, we've seen this over the last year during the pandemic as well, a massive increase. However, the other thing that we've seen according to this report as well, is that 21% of enterprises experiences open source software breaches. That's a 430% year over year growth in cyber attacks or open source software. Now, low performing organizations um, really are slowing down their innovation because they're trying to introduce manual processes, compensating processes to deal with the security risk. And they don't really have a good way or a means for stopping updates or making updates in a con conducive way. So we kind of posed this way, how can we increase speed while also increasing our security capabilities? And in the end, as I kind of stated, it's all about creating velocity in your organization. Um, slow release cycles are not only a disadvantage in the competitive economy, it's also creates a, a toil on creating security and addressing security vulnerabilities uh, because they take longer in production. So think about a vulnerability staying in production longer because it takes you such a long time to remediate. And the scary part with this is that less than 40% of companies deploy software more frequently than monthly. So having a month long exposure is very significant. So how do we wanna address these things? But before we do, um, we came across this great quote by Neil Searing, is that at the end of the day, it's all about imposing costs on the malicious act actors. Now, classically, it would mean put a lot of firewalls, a lot of hurdles in place. But actually, our hypothesis is that you can actually impose more cost by continuously uh, changing your posture, what you have in the infrastructure, how you address things. And to really solve this, you need to follow some of the DevOps practices. So why don't we dive in a little bit closer on what do we really mean about specific outcomes? And to do this, 
Um, let's take a look at the DevOps uh, feed, feedback loop that exists and out, uh, articulate what outcomes are we trying to achieve by the set of personas and what are some of the measures that are being used. And these are critical to really see, are you moving the needles? High performing organizations do this in, intuitively. First off, from a development perspective, we wanna build new customer experiences. We measure these things by increasing developer productivity. Now this might not be congruent with what operation wants. They wanna take advantage of innovation offered by the cloud, creating scalability, simplifying operations while also maintaining security. And this has been kind of the classical outcomes to meet SLOs, reduce mean time to recovery. However, there's a new actor that also has a set of practices and outcomes that they want to achieve. And this tends to be the security and compliance side of the house. They want to manage this growing volume of software vulnerabilities. And this persona is really looking at another set of outcomes that is securing the whole secure supply chain and applying those practices to DevSecOps. Now, we think in this talk, we want to also talk about the hows and how can we help enable you. But before we do, we first want to um, ground ourselves into a set of principles that we found are critical to be able to achieve these, these things. So as we look at the key principles on applying some practices, first and foremost, we think that identity and uh, authentication needs to be across the whole supply chain and also your, your systems. You shouldn't have a lack of identity. This creates more ex exposure. Second, you need to have transparency in your system so that you can rationalize over what you're putting in your environment, what has happened, what are attestations there. And there's some great examples of work that we're already doing with software bill of materials, creating trans uh, uh, transparency in what we have. Thirdly, we need to automate things faster and faster. Um, the human element needs, needs to be removed. Again, making it very hard, increasing the cost for, for the bad actors also means by creating automation to simplify this. And using things like three R's, like where you're repairing, repaving, rotating your environment uh, using declar declarative means. Next, we think that the infrastructure really truly needs to be treated as immutable. Same as with the applications as well. They are uh, declaratively defined, so you can create, uh, an, create and identify drift inside of your organization for security, but you can always go back to a particular state because you've declaratively said what that state should look like. And last but not least is also we wanna create zero trust. And it's this notion where instead of thinking of assets and resources, um, you really create implied, that have implied trust based on location. location. But there's no implicit trust between those entities. And rather, trust must be established based on dynamic ev evidence. And we'll be walking through that as well. So now that we talked about some key principles, now let's dive into some hows on how we're going to do that. Andreas? Thank you. It's important to underline that these principles do not exist in isolation from one another. They're tightly interweaved. In order to arrive at zero trust, we must fundamentally be able to ingrain constructs into our system that will help us determine with certainty their trustworthiness. And fundamentally, it starts with a strong foundation of identity. So let's, let's look where we're going back to the left of identity and authentication. Clearly, there, there, are, there are keys and certificates we've been using for quite some time. Now, high profile attacks in recent times, uh, we see the entry point as an exfiltrated credential. An attacker gains this key material and then reuses it to perform lateral moves to do code injection. Now, if we, if we ch change this embedded secrets or this embedded credentials or shared material to be short-lived, it significantly reduces the utility time in, in the event of an exfiltration. Uh, short-lived here means typically an hour or less. Uh, this could be configurable on a pair identity basis and the requirements of, of the environment, but it does help eliminate a very large range of web application attacks. Now, uh, a problem with short-lived keys is how do you provision and deliver 
this credentials to every workload and environments that are dynamically scheduled, elastically scaled. How do you do that across technology boundaries and cloud platforms and machines that are come and go and scaled up and down? So starting off the premise that if, if, if we're reasoning in a multi-cloud or hybrid cloud environment and we have a complex distributed system that spans some, some of these boundaries, for any two components to trust each other, they must be able to confirm each other's identity and that ensure that the messages exchanged in between them haven't been tampered with. A great example of an implementation that codifies this key attributes we see on the screen of being, well, short-lived credentials, make it platform agnostic, give it to any workload, regardless of its form factor, that this uh, key material has been uh, cryptographically signed and can be cryptographically verified, that it's programmatic, and that it gets us over the hurdle of, well, I have, I have an API key or I have a certificate, but in order to protect the certificate, I must encrypt it. And now I have a decryption key. I should store this decryption key elsewhere securely. How do I do that? I encrypt it again, and it's, it's turtles all the way down. So we must move from the paradigm of proof of possession onto recognition technology, what would be analogous to a fingerprint or a retina scan. And with that, software credential zero, wherever a workload pops up. So the Spiffy Inspire projects, both at an incubation level from the CNCF, are a set of APIs and associated tooling that provide uniform language for describing a service identity in a wide range of workloads, a wide range of orchestration systems, a wide range, range of uh, providers, and uh, different layers of abstraction. If you have uh, confidential computing capabilities, if you have T's and TPMs for, as examples of those, if you need to introspect the different layers of like your provider I am, your container orchestration uh, framework and the kernel itself, in order to verify those identities, only issue them if workloads meet the shape and size you expect them to be and providing that workload with that identity and the key material that it can cross authenticate to other systems. Now, this, this is done at, at multiple layers. Uh, I'd encourage you, and we'll have references at, at the end of the presentation of, uh, there's attestations uh, within the ontology of, of the projects for doing verification of the infrastructure a workload runs, ensure that it's trustworthy, it's not rogue, it is infrastructure that does belong to you and it hasn't been tampered with, as well that as the workload, uh, as be it a container or a function. Uh, so there's two layers like node as well as a process level introspection. Now, this is fairly general purpose. Uh, once we have this in place, uh, it solves beyond, well, we talk about that credential zero. So you're not only cross authenticating between workloads, you can authenticate from a workload to a secret store, you can authenticate from a workload to a database without using any username or password, but doing direct uh, authentication using uh, the certificate. The framework suppo supports both JODs uh, as well as X509s. It can do secretless authentication to your cloud provider. So if you're talking to AWS, to RDS or a Lambda function, you can use your spiffy identity to receive uh, to have an IAM binding and receive and exchange a uh, STS token that you can talk to any, any third party service uh, outside of the infrastructure identified. And you can have uh, trust boundaries and, and trust domains uh, modeled accordingly to that. So that's enough of Spiffy Inspire. Uh, hope that speaks to your attention, but let's look at uh, the next level up, how we start to model once we have that strong bedrock of identity. Uh, it lets us start to reason holistically around privilege, 
and performing least privilege, which is for every function in the system or every user in the system that initiates a task as well as the task in itself should operate with the least amount of privilege necessary to complete the job. So supply chains are, are complex. Software factories are complex. Uh, more cloud adoption means a proliferation of cloud native solutions. Uh, more cloud native solutions means uh, more moving parts in producing software. And more moving parts uh, and tooling and picks and shovels. So we, we can agree that supply chains can be overly com complex, but it can help as engineers to break it down in discernible parts and uh, implement defense in depth that's commensurate with an organization's level of risk and assurance. So at every, at every stage of a logical pipeline or a logical supply chain extending a little bit further, there, there are some key things to, to think about. So we got to think about securing the source code. Uh, know who's in your Git repo, enforce MFA, sign your commits. Next up, you want to look at securing the dependencies. You want to scan the dependencies, generate a software bills of materials that can be ferried along the artifacts. You want to harden and secure the pipeline itself. Uh, move away from, well, rel release engineering uh, came up with the system and it's being handed off to security to come and harden it. You want to make sure you, you make it intrinsically secure from the onset. So leveraging state-of-the-art technology to ensure that you preserve the integrity and confidentiality across every single step, constructs like identity and, and others that we're gonna talk a little bit more uh, come into the picture. Uh, you want to secure the artifacts that are gonna be, well, produced from source and go along and like the byproduct of, of the pipeline itself. You wanna start moving towards reproducible builds. And ultimately, well, what goes into production, uh, that's crown jewels, keys to the kingdom. You want to gate what makes it into uh, production based off the metadata and all the insights and telemetry that you have around your, your artifacts. If you see that uh, a particular artifact has a severe risk vulnerability uh, off its SBOM, uh, you might want to enforce some gating criteria at that point. Uh, there's different layer, le ways to do binary authorization, but well, something we wanna, we wanna put in your mind for you to think about and, and strongly consider. So let's look next at what other supply chain tools do you want to assess and evaluate to make part of your toolkit? Ultimately, DevSecOps is about giving developers the autonomy and the agency to develop as fast as they want, but to do so securely and be able to give them a, a range of options, give them the technology they want give, to uh, be able to secure applications upfront. So... There's several screenshots with, within this picture, things we have on, on the left side of, of the slide. Uh, we showcase uh, a screenshot of the hardware repository. We have uh, VMware's Carbon Cloud Black, uh, which leverages a considerable amount of open source. There's some other great tooling like uh, Google's, uh, not pictured here, uh, open source vulnerability database, osv.dev. And it's, it's all driving towards creating experiences that uh, reduce the noise to signal ratio and boosting those signals by leveraging insights telemetry and having actionable insights. Uh, there are a number of other considerations within a pipeline, uh, what we see on 
on the right hand side of the greatest and latest around uh, Linux Foundation and CNCF projects, such as the update framework uh, for signing and verification uh, in total around supply chain logs, having clear understanding of the inputs and outputs and expected steps to be carried out and make sure that there's high fidelity and confidence that there hasn't been any, any deviations from architectural intent. intent. There is the umbrella of projects under six store, which uh, leverage tamper proof uh, transparency logs and tamper proof ledgers. Uh, so in the event of a compromise, it's readily apparent and known to the world that something off has occurred. Uh, but during regular business, knowing that, well, everything, everything is, is tight and as expected to be trivia as, in, as a scanner. So these are some of the of the noteworthy projects we want we want to highlight uh, that we want you to start looking into. Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive uh, list, but uh, helping helping make all this innovation consumable is is our primary goal, which takes me on to uh, the next slide, which is. You, you've done quite a bit within the development and tying, tying it all together. As we were gearing up to the right, doing that admission control and doing policy as code to be able to declare your organization's compliance and regulatory objectives and be able to use a uh, gatekeeper. So rather than blocking applications from scaling based off a scaling event, you know upfront whether something should be uh, allowed because it meets the bar to run in production uh, through the use of, like we look at uh, mutating admi admission webhooks and gatekeeper and being able to write rego policies around these. So you can reason around uh, different risk levels if a workload has an SBOM, and the absence of an S-bomb, if, if this particular environment is not highly regulated, that's fine, but maybe this is PCI, so this shouldn't, without the absence of an S-bomb or without a detailed understanding of the composition of this workload, it shouldn't be present here and turn it down. And this is a feedback loop, uh, ends up incentivizing and driving for uh, better development outcomes. And Reeve, you take me to the to the next and uh, last slide before I pass it to you. Uh, something I mentioned briefly was, well, there's great technology. Part of the problem is it's hard to use, it's hard to consume. There's certainly end user organizations that are doing a great job at it and lighting the path for others. We have partnered with many of, of, of these end user organizations, our customers, to make sure that we codify these principles and best practices. And much as we have done with Kubernetes to externalize, generalize that, and make it applicable to the outside world. So we drive to a world, world where our applications are, are safeguarded. We're putting a lot of effort around the production of templates and code examples where you, progressively you can arrive at what's modeled in, in this picture in a model of like crawl, walk and run. Uh, this is entirely modular and pluggable. Some of the parts you see in the picture are, are optional, uh, but they're at the time uh, the most mature and, and the ones we, we advocate for. But all the way from, from source to production, the different steps, uh, triggering off your testing, uh, handling metadata, handling the references between an artifact and its metadata, handling the reference between an artifact and its signature, and uh, helping, you, helping you reason about it in a very logical way and help giving you also the constructs uh, to be able to realize the benefits from it. So uh, we're here uh, from VMware Tansu once again, uh, helping you make supply chain security approachable and consumable and happy to help you get started. And Ree, with that, I'll 
I'll pass it back back on to you to close this up. Great, Andres, that was very insightful. And uh, maybe to kind of echo to as well, we're, we're really on this mission of compo making things composable, right? Like uh, creating the builds materials, be able to continuously build your, your software, um, providing gatekeeping mechanisms into what you get deployed and reason over things, what, what should really be, be running. So we're also very excited that the, uh, in the Tanzu portfolio and, and with our partnership with, with GitLab as well, you can actually uh, come check things out on our, our website as well. We provide some, some key links on some of the individual projects. Uh, a lot of the, our projects are actually open source available as well for you to start experimenting with and really creating that thread of uh, building a secure supply chain. With that, um, I wanted to thank everybody for uh, attending this session. We're looking forward to the engagement after the, after the session and uh, reach out to us. So with that, thank you so much and have a wonderful conference.